This is day six of the July-August seven-day retreat, 1999, in spring water. I've only written down two new questions, and then maybe we can read some of the leftover ones. Sometimes if I've read them at the beginning of a talk, they will enter into the talk. I'm beginning to wonder whether in becoming fascinated with one detail after another of my personality and taking it under a microscope, as it were, I'm becoming increasingly interested in myself. And in some way, some details of my personality diminish, but the self with its self-concern seems to be on the increase or grow. It seems like a greed for accumulating intent, interest and knowledge about myself. At the same time, it feels as though there was something like a fence around myself. This is not an infrequent question that comes up. That's why I've picked it. And the other one is also representative of questions that come up. Can one become so attached to the idea and maybe here and there a glimpse of wholeness, non-duality, that one ignores self-centered problems about oneself, ignores one's conflicting relationships with others or conflicted relationships with others. We can see the, the two aspects here. One, is there a danger of becoming too intricately involved with every detail of my personality? And as the person said, it seems as though as maybe this or that detail diminishes or recedes, something seems to be on the increase, namely the concern about myself, a greed for knowledge or interest in myself. And maybe connected with that, a feeling of being fenced off. And the other aspect is, can one become so fascinated with the idea and maybe a glimpse one has had of wholeness that there is attachment now to this idea of being whole, non-dual, the whole universe, and therefore ignoring or maybe even denying, not giving attention to what goes on in one's moment-to-moment -moment living inwardly anger or difficulty in relationship. It sounds as though this was an either-or proposition. Either I become interested in learning about this conditioned personality, its reactions, or I become immersed in the whole or emptiness in which personality, so one thinks and may hear, plays no role, has no importance. which could be an easy escape from looking how one lives and reacts, thinks and deceives oneself from moment to moment, and the difficulty in relating to each other through endless images and remembrances. 
the difficulty of relating directly, <coughs> genuinely. Just thinking or attaching to the concept, idea of wholeness, non-duality, and making a, an intentional attempt or an effort to remain, to keep the mind free from problems, cutting them off through attaching to a practice or that empty space that the mind is capable through practice to create for itself. Which is a limited space and it needs a constant sustained effort to keep it going. I don't think these are two different approaches. They can be, but they need not be either to concern oneself with attaining emptiness or wholeness, enlightenment, or to go the psychological way, finding out about all the intricacies of the psyche, which we also call one's personality. question always comes down to how does one look and listen to something that is happening now or reverberates in memory right now as the mind has woken up from reverie or fantasy or dream. How does one look? Does one look with a certain greed, as the person described it, to, to get this thing, to know it. And then it usually is committed to memory. Now I know more about myself. My knowledge about myself is increasing. Or does one look because something has happened or is happening? It's there. And the mind is not trying to accumulate, keep, preserve store, but to understand as something happens, as it happens. Not analytically or cumulatively owning it, explaining it, but to see it free from judgment, free from our customary reaction of wanting to be rid of it or justifying it. We talked at length about anger yesterday or the day before. Can one see it either before it is <coughs> up, before it has exploded, as it is coming up, or as it is exploding, after it has exploded, as it is sustained by bringing up the memory of it and adding commentary with it, which has an incendiary nature fueling the fire through the way one puts it to oneself, can that all be observed as it happens without making one bit more out of it than what is happening? Not comment upon comment about comment. To watch that carefully. Because as something is clearly and barely observed, austerely observed, it does not augment. Neither the anger is augmented nor the interest in oneself. It's just something that is happening in a human being who is representative of all human beings who have anger manifesting through thought and past experience. And what we mentioned the other day, deeply ingrained programs of territorialism, rivalry, protection of the young, trying to keep what is one's own, accumulating the food, not sharing it, 
these old programs as well as new programs through thought and memory. This is common to all of us. We're not unique in this, even though one may feel shame or justify oneself as though this was one's own problem and no one else's or only a few people. Or, of course, before one discovers it in oneself, one thinks it's only the problem of other people. So, can one look out of spaciousness, out of non-duality, at what is happening, as it is happening, when it happens, or has happened. And saying, looking out of non-duality means what? How is duality created in the first place? Because this universe, this whole life, is not a dualistic affair. It is one ongoing, unfathomable, unknowable in its totality process. How does the feeling of duality or separation arise in the first place? And this is... This one can find out for oneself, not try to get to the beginning of time when it must have arisen with Adam and Eve, the first human beings. I'm not saying they were the first human beings. (laughs) But they were probably representative of the first human being. But observe it as it arises freshly, this moment. Maybe at the That's why some people say anger feels so great or sex feels so great because there's no feeling of separation from it. There's just this going on. And and a consummation with it. And then thought says, I have anger. I am angry. I shouldn't be angry. I have a right to be angry. This is justified anger. This was even at a spiritual training center where I was for many years. I was said there are two kinds of angers and two kinds of prides. There's justified anger and justified pride. This saves me as someone who has that and doesn't have to feel ashamed about it. But in looking at this happening of anger, If shame happens, it's part of the happening. It's happening, it's taking place. One can see it, it is thought and memory, indoctrination, commandments from parents and teachers, or what one has read. All of this, all of these programs running as a stream, vast running stream which has run for thousands of years, hundred thousand of years, stream of thoughts and programs and ideas, freshly manifesting in each newborn human being, some of it may be already genetically programmed and some picked up instantly with a very receptive brain which supposedly peaks in its receptivity at the age of two or in its plasticity to to learn, to, to imitate, to pick up. And the one big program in this vast ongoing stream is this me self program that I am separate from the stream. That as I look at my consciousness as what is happening, I'm looking at something objective from a place outside of it, which is not true. It's one part thinking about another, maybe with a glimpse of awareness in there, but it is so overlaid with the immediacy of thought about it, 
comment, blame. And this deep-seated idea, I got to do something about myself or about the others. I got to improve. And improvement means control or installation of new, different programs. It's not something radically different. This, all of this is not happening to an, a psychological entity, even though this is what we believe we are, because we've always thought this way. And we still think this way. And when we think this way, we are that. That idea that I'm a separate entity, psychologically, organismically, we are all separate organisms. But they too come from the same evolution. Brain, as we said the other day, has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. It's not mine or yours, or mine or your consciousness. It's one highly evolved brain and organism that is newly created through egg and sperm, which dates back to thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, genetic sharing, genetic pooling, out of which talents mendel out in combining. And then we say, this is mine, I own that. That's a thought of this vast stream. I shouldn't be angry is a thought which separates the one who is angry from this ongoing explosion or process which we described the other day, which is observable, all the intricacies of it, physiologically and psychologically, verbally. So what does it mean to look or to feel it or to listen to it non-dualistically <clears throat> out of a vast space that is not programmed into me and you, us and them. It's just awareness that is all embracing, whole and sheds light on what is going on in this stream, in this organism, in this thought stream, and how the thoughts affect the heart, the lungs, the blood pressure, the intestines, the stomach, the muscles. It's observable to such a holistic degree that there isn't the idea this is this is me doing it. It's the thought affecting organ, an organ affecting thought in all of us, in each one of us. And then in each one of us comes a thought, I'm bad or I'm good. And the attachment to that thought of what I am, which is a composite of what we've ever thought about ourselves and, of course, what others have thought and voiced about ourselves. You are this or you are that. Little children already tell what they are because their parents have told them what they are. If they hadn't heard that, they wouldn't think that way. They would feel anger or, or greed, but there wouldn't be this guilt about it. the separation from it, or the denial. We notice in our little five-year-old granddaughter, if, if anything was mentioned about her, she instantly denied it. She didn't want to have part of any guilt or blame. And it was very inventive in little lies about how this happened. And she believed it because this was protection from blame. And with this 
evolves this feeling of a me that needs to be protected or aggrandized or diminished, cut off, which is more thought about myself as, as this person is observing. The more I observe and feel about myself, the more something else grows about myself. Something may diminish, something else is on the increase. The fascination with myself. My traits, my suffering, my uh, feelings, my fate. Does one get a feeling for the difference between seeing something barely, austerely, as it is, and the the commentary that starts growing around it like a like a hedge, making something out of it, and then the reaction to the commentary. How bad this is of me, or how good or how I should strive and get rid of it, be better. And I'm a hopeless case. Not as good as others, but I must surpass others. All of these impulses programmed into us through everything, the media, the TV, the parents, the teachers, the books we read. All hiding the bare fact of what just happened or was an angry reaction, or a fear coming up, an excitement, a pleasure. Can, can one listen to that and see it, hear it, feel it, the senses together, perceiving as it is, and beware of the embellishing comment so that that doesn't take up the whole scene, take over, the embellishment takes over. And what caused the embellishment is, may already have died down, gone, passed by if the embellishment didn't, didn't keep it going. And if one comes to a silent retreat, maybe just for a day or two, it is a marvelous thing to sit quietly and hear the birds and insects, smell all the fragrances of grasses and flowers. One person said, I, I don't think there's another place I've ever been to which is as eli alive with creatures. to the extent that we, the, the thoughts about ourselves calms down, we, we, we come alive ourselves. We are one of those alive creatures here, together with the little tiny ones, the bugs, the grasshoppers, crickets, butterflies, the moths, the tiny frogs and the big cro the big croakers. Here and the idea wild turkeys fluttering around if you scare them on the path. It's marvelous to, to be quiet and in touch with where we all came from, where we all belong, of which all of us are an integral part of this wholeness of life. And all our psychological thought worries about ourselves, thought and body worries about how we are and how people see us, what they think about us and what we should attain in this life, our goal and purpose, make something out of ourselves, 
to impress our parents or succeed in this competitive society, all of this all of a sudden doesn't seem to fit into this alive day or moment of all creatures sounding and buzzing. Of course, you could say, wait a minute, they're also taking care of their young, feeding, eating, mating. Yeah, they're doing that, but without a thought about it, without a worry about it. Near where we used to live, there was a robin building a nest. Amazingly, the, busy, the, the busyness of both Mr. and Mrs. Robin building a nest and then sitting on there and bringing food to each other and then the little ones. One year, the eggs were down on the ground, broken, and the robins were hopping around building another nest. not encumbered by grief or blame or trying to find the perpetrator and punish him. Because it's not symbolized in the mind. The mind is there to do what is needed this moment. And the, of course one may project it into it, interpret it, but there seems to be a certain zest for living and pecking and flying. the erectness of the posture, the attentiveness of the, of the eyes, is this unencumberedness by worrying whether tomorrow the eggs may be taken again. They may be, or they may not be, but right now it's building a nest. Because we're not robins, we have a much bigger brain which we pride ourselves on, so that was our accomplishment. It's evolved this way and with us has evolved a tremendous potential for trouble, which is manifesting in the world, throughout the globe. Conflict, hatred and killing each other out of symbolic incentives. Of course, some of them are economic, but if we got together, we could share what this earth produces quite well. There would be enough for all of us at this moment. I don't know how it will be if we keep growing and growing and growing, but if the mind is unencumbered, it is amazingly inventive and creative. Particularly if, if it is pooled with other minds, and listens to other people suggest things, and not identify with one's own proposition. This is what we do too. As though it was a piece of me, my proposition, and then I have to defend it. We can't listen to a much better proposition. Because this person is attacking me. So we think. Can, can we discover that at a discussion and, and be done with that and listen again to all propositions? It's a marvelous thing to think together and create together, which can only happen if we're not identified what comes out of this particular mouth and brain and experience, which isn't mine anyways. It has to do with everyone ever contacted and everyone that they ever contacted, which is everyone. So can one watch attachment to this idea of me and mine? My thought, my suggestion, my this or that, my, my territory.
and watch it not with this predominant habit of blaming oneself or blaming the ones who did this to me that I became that way because they also were programmed. We talked about this at the very beginning. If one can unveil this constant blaming tendency and be done with it as it is discovered. If it comes up again, dismantle it. See it, be done with it. Not, not be seduced by that and distorted by it. Because if we blame, we don't see. And if we see blame is not necessary, it's clear how something happened. Or if it's not clear, then it's confused and still doesn't need blame. And in looking or sitting together, discussing, looking at oneself as things come up, to listen to the wind, also it's there. It's there in this present aliveness. The hum of the plain and the cicadas. So there doesn't come this narrow, ever narrowing focus on me. Which brings no release from these programs. It, as, as this person said, as one is discovered, another is augmented. The idea of what I am and holding on to that idea. Or that I must, <coughs> must strive to diminish it all, strive to get rid of it all, which is an enhancement of the idea of me as the progressive striver and attainer. Or victor. So when, when nothing comes up, sitting quietly, taking that luxurious leisure to listen quietly to what's there, if nothing comes up, then they are just the sounds of silence, of quietness, spaciousness. If thoughts come up, can they be seen and heard and felt out of this spacious silence, which means nothing mysterious, but aware of blame or fault-finding or judgment and not falling for it, not getting roped into that web. Because then it's the end of, of seeing non-dually. Then the me is there as the judge. judging itself. It's so absurd, isn't it, if one looks at it logically. Who is judging whom? It's just one process of thinking. Do you see that? Can one see that? For moments at a time, so that the whole picture changes from falseness to correctness. I'm not saying good or bad. But to see what is false and to see it correctly. It's all thought about thought when I think about me. People have asked me, I didn't put it down, I'm so self-conscious. What is that? This Burden of self-consciousness, which I know very well. I used to be a, a very, very self-conscious child, teenager, young woman, older woman. But today it's very clear that self-consciousness is simply thinking about oneself. And with all the past that reverberates, all the desires and fears, all the wants, reverberating with thinking about oneself 
And therefore also the thought, will this be seen right? Well, how will he or she think of me, like me? Will I impress? Seen as important, seen as unimportant. All of these thoughts make us self-conscious. Despaired of ever, ever making one step among people without self-consciousness. Is that possible? At that time it wasn't clear what that was. But it's very simple. As one doesn't think about oneself, the steps and movements become more natural. Because one isn't trying through thinking and remembering and imaging to do something. One's not thinking about it, one's just walking. If somebody says something critical or praising, all right, you hear it, maybe there's an emotion, but you don't have to keep thinking about it. Then you're free of it. Why do we keep thinking about it? Because it's our habit. Or we think it's dangerous. Or we want more of that praise. And then become attached to that person who said the praising thing. And then if that person all of a sudden doesn't praise us or praises someone else, there's the misery again. Feeling bad about oneself. Can one observe all of that in a fresh breeze of summer wind rustling all the leaves and grasses? Not how can I ever get rid of self-consciousness, but understanding how it arises, what maintains it, without blame. And therefore understanding it in each other. Sharing it if we're so inclined to talk about it to inquire into it. Two people, three people, maybe 20 people who are interested. Looking at something together, not to accumulate knowledge, but to find out about what is happening as it's happening, which <coughs> so encumbers our great yearning for freedom, spontaneity. and not beginning at some future goal, but now, here, with what's there, the way it is. Because it isn't otherwise, it's like this. Whether it ever will be otherwise, who knows? I got to look now, not worry about tomorrow. Then I can't look now. Can I? The universe is vast, vast. Why, why do I act the way I do? Why do I react with hurt? Let's see, let's find out. Watch it, feel it, and make nothing out of it for the future.
We will end here for today.